Hello everyone, uh, welcome to ITV Celebrities Interviews. Today I welcome Vince Rogers, historian of popular cinema. And we will talk about Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee, an international phenomenon spanning generations. As Vince tells us every time. Hello Vince, isn't this great? We're in France's most beautiful Japanese gardens. Well, listen, this is pure happiness. It feels like we're in Hong Kong, you see, we're there. So you are here for our show about Bruce Lee? Yes, well, listen, it's... Uh, and so we'll do our utmost for him and his honor. Well, we do have to pay tribute to a global icon after all. And so we will develop on this further, okay? Well, Bruce Lee, of course, I saw him for the first time at the cinema, so we could say live. He was in Big Boss. Big Boss was a very violent movie for that time, and a movie that was leaning towards fantasy cinema. You know, especially the scenes that take place in the ice factory. So there was a bit of cool side to hit with neon lights, and it was really. I thought it was very innovative, and nobody knew who Bruce Lee was. So, Big Boss, Fist and Fury, The Way of the Dragon, and of course, Enter the Dragon. Of all these are movies that I saw at the cinema, and I saw the movies like Lowe's movies, who directed Bruce Lee. Bruce did not get along with him, and if you will, Big Boss was a real revelation. You see a new type of a cinema, cinema that was so exotic to us. There was a break from the traditional Western action movies, but with roots, you see, so that was a revelation to me and to many other cinema-loving comrades of that era, if you will. And we continued, we got closer and closer to this type of a cinema, and we continued to go to these movie theaters that were in decline. These local movie theaters that were disappearing, and so actually the Kung Fu movies and Bruce Lee were the home stretch for local and popular cinemas. There you go. Well, as I told you, this Kung Fu cinema and this Hong Kong cinema, since they actually were Asian productions, made in Hong Kong by Golden Harvest, it was a total discovery for us, because we were not used to that. You see, but fantasy cinema was a landmark, in the sense that the fighting was so excessive, the guys were thrown into the air, they were fighting in the air. So we had, if you will, we discovered that fantasy cinema that we love so much again, that popular cinema of local cinemas, but with this mix of exotic cinema, so it was a discovery but not a beach rule if you will, of the type of the cinema that we like. So that was a progression into another universe, and it's true that Bruce Lee, he created the Kung Fu cinema, he created and started a trend, will develop this later, he started a movement with Western actors, manga, etc. In short, at the time, in the 70s, we were in the middle, or even in the early 70s, we rediscovered the popular cinema, you see, thanks to Bruce Lee, Thanks to the Hong Kong cinema, there you go.
Well, so Bruce Lee was born in San Francisco in America. His mom didn't want him to hang out with street gangs, so you see, he couldn't hang out with people whom his mother didn't approve of. So she sent him to Hong Kong, so he was raised in Hong Kong by his father. We need to mention at this point that Bruce Lee came from an artistic background. His father was a star in of Cantonese opera, if you will, his father was a star, an important star. So Bruce Lee was from a family of artists, so being a fighter, being a warrior of martial arts, he learned drama and as a child he acted in Chinese Hong Kong movies, you see? So as a child he learned how to be an artist before being a fighter. So he stayed in Hong Kong with his father. He appeared in Hong Kong movies, then he came back to America. This Hong Kong America link, if you will, allowed him to get familiar with combat sports. From the years 1954 and 1955, he was introduced to combat sports, but he wasn't satisfied, so he created his own art, you know that, but he also attended a lot of fighting schools. In the USA, he opened his own martial arts studio. So he was an instructor, a martial arts coach, and he started to frequent cinema circles. He was put by an American producer who was looking for an actor, an Asian actor, for a series. This series didn't get off the ground, but he was selected to play the role of Kato in the series The Green Hornet. This famous popular series, if you will, resumed the character of the Hornet, who is a character coming from the serials. So the this emblematic series that lasts only one season launched his career. It was an American production for Bruce Lee, and after the, that he was put by the show bosses. Robert Shaw spot him. It was looking for a Chinese American man to take part in his filming in Hong Kong. He wanted to expand the Hong Kong cinema internationally, and it Bruce Lee who was selected, but he did not get along with the show bosses. He went to the Golden Harvest, which for was a smaller film company, but made some really good movies, and he launched his career with Big Boss, the movie we talked about earlier. Was it because of money matters? No, I don't think so, it was more of a human matter, if you will. Very early, Bruce Lee was leaning towards directing, you see, he directed his first movie in Hong Kong, he was an actor, but he also wanted to be a director, so he was ambitious, but in a good sense of the word. He wanted to live life to the fullest, he wanted to make movies, he was a real actor, a businessman, and you see, a very wise man. And so his Hong Kong career was launched. The movie had a global success. Big Boss started all, if you will, from Hong Kong to across borders. The movie was released in the West to Bruce Lee came back to the USA. He didn't become an important star in the USA straight away. He started sh shooting for television again. He took part in an American series with James Franciscus, a very good actor who played in the Planet of the Apes. So he had a TV career and then of course he progressed and, and there was Enter the Dragon in international production, a big one, a heavy one, and that was the birth of this iconic phenomenon. You see, Bruce Lee became an icon during his, his lifetime, as were Presley and the Beatles, there are a, a very few. Dean, James Dean was an icon after his death, Marilyn after her death, Bruce Lee, no. He was an icon immediately, you see, and developed the Bruce Lee brand. He developed Kung Fu Exploitation.
écoute, oui, là, là on est vraiment on est dans le... Ah, well, listen, now we really are at the heart of the topic, if you will, so Hollywood, Hollywood before Lee and Western cinema before Bruce Lee, had the perspective of Asians that was based on popular culture, popular literature, what is called pop culture in America, that is to say pop culture in the 40s, 50s, and before novels, if you will, Sax Cromer, Sax Cromer, who created the character of Fu Manchu. Fu Manchu was a representation of the dark side, the demiurge, and in Asian popular literature, a bit like the character of Fantomas here. In Europe, there was Bob Moran, and his mortal enemy was the Yellow Shadow. So the Western popular culture before Lee weaved Asia with a bit of concern, with characters that were a little, a little bit strong, a little bit violent, a little bit shaming, you see. For example, here there was Maurice Lima as Atomos, you see. There was Atomos' daughter, then there was Fu Manchu's daughter. So you see, actually, there was an ominous heredity. The popular literature created these characters. And on the other hand, there was, of course, a breakthrough, if you will, of the Asian ethnic group in the USA, as there was for blacks. You can say that there was a beginning of the Asian exploitation as there was after the black exploitation. And you had this with an actor like Kei Luke, a Japanese actor in the 40s who played detective characters, you see, men who investigate but always with a mysterious aura. There was always this side in areas that were a little mysterious like Chinatown. There was Mr. Wong, of course, Mr. Wong with Karloff. You go see Karloff's alter ego also played the role. So it was Detective Mr. Wong, you see, in Chinatown, a kind of Asian Sherlock Holmes, but still in a niche that didn't take off. And then Bruce Lee broke through in the early 70s in the Green Hornet, where he already had an important role in the series Kung Fu. He missed out on the role, which was taken by Karin. So there was a bit of bitterness, you know. That's why he decided to go towards production. He was heavily invested in Enter of the Dragon. Cherry. And also, he found himself playing the small role in the film Marlowe. Vince, he did. Cherry, he dies in the... Vince, he did, he played small roles or medium roles in cinema. Cherry, okay. Vince, in our own side, if you will, and he played several roles as well because he was a fight scene choreographer. Cherry, of course. Vince, you see, we always go back to stunts. From stunts, he went on to play actual roles and from playing roles and stunts, he went on to playing small and average parts, and that's how he ended up playing Kato. And Kato saw the green on it. That's where lunch in Scaria, as I told you earlier. In Hong Kong, you see, Bruce Lee kept going from go Hong Kong to Hollywood, then back to Hong Kong, then Hollywood, and then he went to Rome. He went to Rome for the movie with Chuck Norris, taking place at the Coliseum. That was the first movie, the first Kung Fu movie shot in Europe, which started a trend. We'll talk about this one further later.
Well, this only space was prominent and they, you know, it's always, you know, how can I say, the crossroads of careers and personalities, we find that in important characters. For example, we see we can compare him to John Wayne. John Wayne, when he came a star in important roles and when revolution is at the Western John. You see, John Wayne, as we explained in the program we did at the film library, John Wayne revolutionized the Western John, he modernized it, he brought violence. You see, John Wayne's gunshots, John Wayne's punches, this was new stuff. That's what made him successful. He was a many actor who went for fights, he went for fights, you see, gunfights. Bruce Lee, it's the same. With Bruce Lee, no guns, but he brought that about. Afterwards, we can make a lot of comparisons, like Sergio Leone, who modernized, if you will, for the second time, the Western genre with the Italian version. With Clint Eastwood, his trilogy is the same, you see. He brought violence, he brought energy, he brought soundtracks, soundtracks that were very important in his movie. In Enter the Dragon, the soundtrack is very important. Bruce Lee screams, it was new, you see, it was part of the soundtrack. So it was very innovative, very innovative, like Dan Fisher for the fantasy movies, the Dracula movies, the movies that were the legacy of the great American Gothic movies in the 30s, 40s and 50s. Terry Fisher, he blew that up, he brought color, he brought bloody gore effects. Soft for that time, but these were very new. And we come back to Asia Terry Fisher when he shot his Dracula movies in the 50s and his Frankenstein movies. There were versions that very much more violent that were made for Asia. So you see, Asia people have quite a violent culture in popular cinema and we see this in Kung Fu cinema, we see in manga cinema, it's very violent. So you see here, if you will, how could I say, a permanent innovation but related to an innovation of cinema, that's to say, systematically at the crossroads of the cinema history, you have guys and girls who arrived and who brought modernity. George Romero, horror cinema, explodes with The Night of the Living Dead, you see, a very low budget student movie. It was an end of study movie. He made it an, an emblematic thing, and a thing, if you will, that started a trend. He invented the genre, like Bruce Lee invented the genre. You see, we develop that. Oh, listen, I think his legacy is it's permanent and it has been going on since his career during his lifetime and of course after his death it exploded and it's true, he has, as we said earlier, he created a genre. That's it. Kung Fu cinema, modern action cinema, it's thanks to him, I, I think, if you will, the legacy is in all the movies that came out, all the modern action movies. I think, of course, that actors like Schwarzenegger, like Bruce Willis, like Stallone, even if they didn't play in Kung Fu movies or martial arts movies, I think they wouldn't have developed this type of movies. The scripts wouldn't have been written. Of course, then, there are movies with pure martial arts, like Jackie Chan, Seagull, Van Damme, all these people, they wouldn't have had. But Jackie, who was a stuntman in Bruce Lee's movies, Oh yes, yes, he, he was at the Golden Harvest. So all these movies, all these actors, they are specialized actors who come from martial arts or actors, stuntmen in action movies, movies like Stallone's action movies, movies with a hero, if you want hero movies, all these people owe their success. And how can I say, they owe the existence of the cinema genre to Bruce Lee. You can also say, if you will, that Bruce Lee played an important part in the Kung Fu exploitation after his death. A subgenre was created with the ninja movies. The ninja movies would have never existed if there had not been traditional Kung Fu movies. So it's a genre that, that lasted a really popular genre that had been fully exploited. And we continue to have ninja movies and there are ninja fighters even in video games. And I could have said, I'll go as far as to say that manga culture, manga culture is Lee. You see, if UFO robot Grand Deezer, if all these serials, cartoons, movies with Japanese actors, XO, all these production, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, they were successful, if you will, internationally, on TV, all thanks to Bruce Lee. 
You see Asian culture as a prominent place, but within the structures of action cinema, you even see it in the fighting scenes, if you will. How can I say the fight scenes with Bruce Lee, Schwarzenegger? Bruce Lee, there are martial arts in this, you see. There are former soldiers, former parachutists, you so you see, we implied that, that these guys were, they were military, they were doing combat sports. And that's Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee's legacy, if Bruce Lee had not existed, we would have continued with gunfights, old-fashioned fights, you know. So he was really innovative, you see. There's before and after Bruce Lee, that's clear. And it's funny, Jackie Chan, his favorite actor was Jean-Paul Belmondo. Ah, but Bebel, Bebel started a trend. We will develop this later, if you will. The American school, Douglas Fairbanks, Lancaster, all had an influence on Bruce Lee. You see, it all interlinks that cinema is alive, you see. It's not like a cinema library, you see, it's alive. It's a local cinema. Well, listen, how can I say the aspect, the innovative aspect, as I told you, of Bruce Lee's arrival on French screens with the big boss, it was urge. In Europe, then again, each country has its own history, but in France, it was very particular. I experienced it in situ because Bruce's Hong Kong cinema, Bruce's movies, if you will, were released at the same time after Hong Kong Kung Fu movies, Lowe's movies, with whom he had shot. Many movies with contemporary actors who didn't have a career like Bruce Lee had. Instead, if you want, in one track, I was going to say Chinese American, Chinese, they didn't actually get out of Hong Kong some co productions. Bruce Lee was particular because he had a double culture. Actually, you know, Bruce Lee, we can say that he was the first cross cultural actor. As I told you earlier, his career was always a constant coming and going between Hong Kong and in the USA. That's it, he's the one who did that, you see. Jackie Chan hit, but a smaller scale, actually. Jackie Chan is still based in Hong Kong, even if he played in international movies. But with Bruce Lee's particular, Bruce Lee was born in San Francisco, so you see he was a complete mix of cultures, and he carried this force of mixed cultures forward, and that's, that's very special. And so, to come back to our, your question, it's certain that in this, the movies that came out on the screens draw in crowds of spectators. Many were rockers who went to see Bruce Lee's movies because they showed fights. And then a little anecdote, at that time, as told you earlier, we were talking about, at that time Hollywood was trying to short the, this by releasing a fight movie. They released Rollerball with James Caan, who was fighting to the death. Then in the same week or the same fortnight, there were groups, the punks of the time, who were going to see Bruce Lee. These guys were happy, you see, they started training with Nuchaku, we all did that, we believed we were the same as Bruce Lee. And then after, we were a little confused because Bruce Lee was a little scary, you see. And you see, there was always this warring side, if you will. Asians had this warring side, they really earned a lot of respect there, you see, in everyday in everyday life, if punks met Asian people, they weren't going to piss them off, you see. Bruce Lee brought what I, I call, if you will, the Black's ad, you know, Black pride, Black exploitation, the honor of being Black, Black is beautiful, etc. And Bruce Lee brought the Kung Fu exploitation, the Asian pride, 
And if you will, the pride to be Asian, he brought that. So there was a double impact, the impact of the recognition of the Asian people as a people, if you will, with culture and God news. There is a culture in China, you see. And Hong Kong is special since Hong Kong was part of the British colonial empire. Hong Kong was more or less left of her own devices. Historically, uh, there was only a brief time, you see, when the English were present, so there was always the exchange between the West and China, you see, Hong Kong was particular. And so he brought back, if you will, a greatness to the Asian people, it's very good, but in addition, he did the same for other people who were, who were not particularly Asian, but who were in search of recognition, or people who were in social struggles. Like in South America, for example, in Africa, where he's in, in Idol, you see. He gave pride to smaller populations, you see, and these smaller populations add up to millions of people, millions of guys on the planet who went to see his movies. That's why he became such an icon. He's the only one who achieved that, you see. Thierry, he was the first? Vince, Japanese people had Toshiro Mifune. Thierry, of course. Vince, Keiluke, we talked about it a while ago, Japanese were leading until the... So, how do you say, in the representation of Asian characters in cinema, you see, Korean too, but they lost ground, you see, while still having very good careers. Toshiro Mifune was a worldwide star, but he wasn't an icon, like Lee. Lee outdid Toshiro Mifune, who was very respectable. He made beautiful movies, and same with other Japanese actors. You see, in the American series, they were cast as a second or a third role, plat patrol of the cosmos. You see all these series. Same for the black exploitation, but Lee, Bruce Lee took it to another level. He became an icon. There's only one each century, and it was him. It was him and the preponderance of what he did. Let me tell you, going back to Nice, for example, the movie theaters that I knew had an impact, if you will, on the survival, survival of the local cinema. I think that if there had not been, if you will, Kung Fu cinema, the local cinemas would have disappeared earlier. You see, Lee and Kung Fu Exploitation Cinema, they came at the end of an era. It was a pivotal time, when local cinemas began to decline. So to continue in the years, at the beginning of the 80s, local cinemas disappeared. They were replaced, as we said at the lecture we presented at the Cinema Library, replaced by the videotape, the video clubs. Video clubs, what made videos clubs successful was the Kung Fu exploitation. Lee's movies, Castle published Lee, you see what I mean. Lee was on the screen at Paris Rex for a month. You could see, you know, his posture, you know, so you see all that was urge of crucial importance, decisive in matters, if you will, of popular cinema in France. I believe that the English, the Germans are the same, and in Italy too, but in France there really was an impact, and it was the start, I told you, of the manga culture, manga in France, in paper edition, of course, and manga on TV, which had a phenomenal success in the late 70s. So to get out of the wave of the Kung Fu exploitation, he was really innovative, and he still is. You see, Bruce Willis, who still makes movies now, I mean, it's Lee. You see all these actors, even in the movies, urban movies with Bronson, with Bruce Willis, just shot a remake. All these movies, the Avenger in the city, in all these movies, there's always the influence of action cinema in the background, violent cinema, radical cinema. Bruce Lee was radical in the fight scenes. These were radical because it's a fighter. Before there wasn't anything like it. You see, it goes to the end and he kills. He kills and he step outside, if you will. How can I say of a traditional fight? I'm not saying that he takes pleasure in it, you see, but it really is the ultimate revenge, you know, the sense when he's grimacing. is terrific, that's new.
Well, listen, that is of course a traditional question. Many people ask this question. Many moviegoers are just fans, I actually think there are a lot of, of heirs. You see, we cannot say that there is a particular heir, even if Jet Li, we mentioned it earlier, Jet Li is close to Bruce Lee because of his physique, his martial arts style, and his real on side. Sometimes in combat scenes, he goes further, if you will. How can I say from the usual archetypes, he can be very violent, very dangerous, as was Bruce Lee. There is this side, a little excess. About Lee, for example, it was said that in one of his two movies, including Big Boss, actually the two that follow Big Boss, he was showing an uneasiness and he was compared to James Dean. You see, myths always intersect, in fact, and it was said that there was, if you will, a depressive syndrome that was really endemic in Asian populations. At the end of the 60s and the beginning of the 70s, civil rights were very poor in Asia. It was very hard for the workers, you see. There have always been social difficulties, so I think there was a malaise in the youth, you see. You know, rebel without a cause, you see, rebels without a cause. Thierry, of course. Vince and Brucey personified that a little, you see. So it was said that he was a little bit like James Dean, if you will, an Asian James Dean. Maybe it's a shortcut, but it's true. So yes, Jet Li, because of the violence and the fragility and the excess of his fight scenes, he is close to Bruce Lee, you see dangerous playing dangerous warriors, very beautiful roles. Otherwise it's global, you see, it's a global legacy. I mean, as I told you earlier, what is pretty amazing with Bruce Lee is that while achieving in, in an international career, starting in Hong Kong and going back to Hollywood, he didn't deny his American heritage, you see. Douglas Fairbanks fighting scenes, the fencing scenes in Fairbanks movies, fighting scenes with a guy like Lancaster, all these actors, if you will, in action movies, even a role film, we can go back further. I mean, these were already the basis of a global action cinema, you see. This was classic action cinema, even though in some movies with fencing scenes, we talk about it at the cinema library, or in some movies with fighting scenes like Western, we talk about Wayne. There are scenes that were a bit extreme, you see. There were sliding violence. That's what Clint Eastwood took over, you see. Clint Eastwood, in his movies, he was out of control. I mean, the characters he played. You see, this made people cringe. The critics, you see, stuck up people, if you will. So, you see, it was all going a little too far. And Lee, he did that. Unfortunately, he died very long, you, you know. So, he didn't have time. I repeat, he didn't have time. When he died, he wasn't even 40 years old. He didn't have time to develop. I think that he would have been terrible. Terrible. I think he would have, in my humble opinion, that he would have given up the game very quickly and he would have gone towards production. He would have produced a lot for TV and important international movies. That's what I think. Cherry. And his relationship with uh, Steve McQueen and James Coburn. Vince. Oh yes, that's what I'm saying. In fact, he was archetypal in the sense that he was. He really had a foot in Hollywood with Presley as well, you see. I mean, with McQueen, you see, it too. There was an uneasiness. Cherry, of course. Vince, there was an Nunes, the action studio where James Dean and Tim McQueen start, amplified, if you will, this actor's discomfort, you see, the so social anxiety. McQueen, as we know, came from popular New York neighborhoods, so there was violence and fights, you see. Now everyone is for, is for peace and we don't go fighting in everyday life, but here we are talking about art, it's like Vince Taylor, you know, the rock and roll singer, a journalist who was a little stuck up also told him, but Vince, what about hard rock, but wet rock and roll is not that violent? What call it hard, you see? I mean, everything is already in the foundations of culture, you see, popular culture is very violent. Terry, of course, Vince, so Lee arrived, we always get back to Lee. There were some emblematic characters. When he stood in cinema, I told you George Romero for the direction, Dan Fisher, you see, Marlon Brando 2, Marlon Brando in the Wild One, and on the Waterfront by Elia Kazan, you see. All this was, this was Hutch. These were violent guys, but who showed this discomfort and this uneasiness. They used it in their acting. Jerry, on screen? 
Vince on screen, and that's how icons were born. Bruce Lee, as I told you earlier, I think he was the ultimate icon. There will be other things in the future, but he represented the end of an era and the birth of a new era, but in iconic terms, if you will, a turning point. Jerry, like with the Old Testament and the New Testament? Vince, well, if you will, we'll close on this beautiful religious note. Jerry, there you go. Vince, but this is pure happiness, if you will, and I think new generations, you know, that they are reissued, so digitized, cleaned, that's why the younger gener generation call modern movies. And these new generations are going to rediscover all that. As I said earlier, it's a pure happiness. Oh well, sure, it's a completely way of life. So when it comes to combat sports, I did a bit of French boxing and English boxing, but only training. So like Jean-Paul Belmondo, I wasn't angry enough, you know, to do professional fights. But I tried that for a while, of course. Asian sports, on the contrary, they are big now. I comrades who were, who did karate, who went into kung fu, and I saw them training, especially. There was this guy, you know, he had glasses or skinny, and the guy asked me to hold, you know, the... Cherry, Makiwara. Yes, it was something else. I told him, you nobody should piss you off all these assholes that bother you every day. If they saw, you know, they wouldn't bother you anymore. So you see, it started a trend. So of course, of course, it's an art of living. I mean, it's, it's cinema, that's what he told. It's about of proof of being who you are. So as I told you, he gave back or even gave pride to millions of people all over the planet. That's a way of life too, when you have people who feel good about themselves, when you have people who are at peace, it can only calm things down. So Bruce Lee was a driving force in that, you see. And afterwards, guys who were into combat sports, either European combat sports and Asian combat sports, or if you want into new fighting sports, there was, you see, the birth of self-defense, and of course, it's an art of living. These guys eat well, they have a healthy life, they have role models, Bruce Lee being one of them. Then you have guys and girls who wanted to work in cinema. You see the Schwarzenegger type, the Seagull type, the Vanden type, all these people, they put pressure on themselves to live a natural and healthy life in order to get to work in cinema. So all these interlinks and Bruce Lee start this trend, as I told you, as only icons know how to do, as Presley did in music, as the Beatles did in music. There is only one by generation. So it's clear in this case that this series you initiated. And we must thank you and congratulate you on that. This series is important because it will highlight, how can I say this whole thing, and it will highlight in truth testimonies of completely different people. So for that, hats off, Cherry.